So, Matt, if your dogs lose their tail, like some weird accident or just, you know, nature makes their tail fall off for some reason, do you know where you'd go to get another tail for your dog? Um, No, I don't. You go to the retail store. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a Laffy Taffy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable. Because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Hey, I'm doing. I'm doing really good. Good deal. Good deal. Cold and rainy here, man. It's just cold here. Yeah, you can take the rain. I'm tired of it. I was trudging around in it today, and <laughs> 45 yeah, degrees man. and rainy is not too much fun. Uh, real quick, we want to say go to podbelly.com. Uh, we're proud members of the Podbelly Network. You can find some different shows to listen to that you may not find any other way. And you can find some information on podcasting and all that stuff there. So go to podbelly.com and check out the Podbelly Network. Um, we also want to thank tonight's sponsors, Best Fiends, Magic Spoon, and a new one to us, Talk Space. And we will talk more about them here shortly. Um, December 4th is y'all's cut off for sending in Christmas stories to us. So if you've got a story for our Christmas episode, time's running out, get it to us by December 4th so that we can get it into the show, get it edited to a good length and read over it and all that good stuff. So, uh, if you don't know what we're doing, then you're probably a new listener and hello to new listeners. Uh, but we do this every year. For our Christmas episode is our listener stories episode. And Matt, real quick, tell them why we do that. So Adam and I like to bring back the Victorian tradition of telling ghost stories around the fire on Christmas Eve. And you guys have been fantastic over the last few years. You've just every year. It's like we get twice as many stories. Oh, yeah. Um it just makes it. And the stories are fantastic. Um, yeah, you guys have some it, good experiences. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you've if you got a weird story to tell, if you've seen something or had an experience growing up, or if you've got a friend or a family member that's got a great story, please share it with us, and we can share it with all the other graveyard members. Um, but, but just try to get them in by December 4th, that gives uh, Adam and I enough time to go through them, uh, get them all formatted so that uh, we can uh, we can record them. That's right. So email it to graveyardtalespodcast at gmail.com or you can text it to our show number, um, which is 430-558-1304. You can text it there if you would like and we'll get it. Um, or you can Facebook message it to us if you would like. Uh, but if you email it, please put in the subject line Christmas 2021 or holidays 2021 or something like that. So we can easily search for it. We get a ton of emails a day and I don't want it to get lost behind the your warranty is due for your car emails, <laughs> which, yes, we get those at a show email that has never had a car <laughs> tagged to that email at all. And I, I get those for the phone number too. We, we get, um, so your extended warranty is on. No, there is no extended warranty on the graveyard tales. We we're, we're running scary here. We've got no warranty, <laughs> no warranty, no warranty on this show. You it, can't this show comes to you as is. Yep. You guys cannot return it for defaulty host or anything like that. You're just stuck with it. All right. So if you've listened to Graveyard Tales for any length of time, then you know Matt and I are obsessed with Best Fiends. And we play it all the time. Play it 
anywhere we go, if we got some downtime, we play it. But I'll tell you what, one thing I've noticed is Best Fiends is really good during the holidays because it can help give you a mental break from any holiday stress you've got or you know if you're hanging out with family members that you're not too enthused about hanging out with just pull up best fiends and start playing while you're sitting there and you don't even have to listen to them you can just delve into best fiends and ignore them and and who who has been on a holiday uh event and had no wi-fi you're you're at grandma's house and even if she had wi-fi it, it, it moves like she does. Somehow she's know? still got dial-up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You don't have to have Wi-Fi or cellular data to play Best Fiends. And that's one of my favorite features is that you can play it, like Adam said, anytime, anywhere. Okay? Now, Amanda, she wears me out on, on this game. I, I can't keep up with her. You know, I... Yeah. I finally beat a level and i'm like hey look i beat this level and then she's like she's beat 10 levels since i started this one yeah she beat it a month ago and <laughs> yeah yeah so you know it, it's but it's fun and, and i keep trying I, you know i know i was like i'm gonna catch up to you one of these days um she just laughs and keeps playing <laughs> and and with the way they add new levels it's it's never it's never ending. I mean, she's going to be able to continue to pick up new levels and new levels and keep going. Um, and and all the, the the special events, you know, are a lot of fun. They change up the regular gameplay a little bit, and you you, you get some new things to do and work on. So, Graveyard tells listeners can go and download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiend. That's right. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. So, Matt, that's all of the housekeeping I've got for today. We'll try to keep it short and sweet because we've got a long episode here. So tell us, what are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight we uh, we're we're actually doing this in reverse. Um, a lot of times we will do a regular show, and then we'll have a Patreon episode that will expound on it a little bit more. We're going backwards this time. We did a Patreon show on ghost ships mm-hmm. uh, a while back, and so we're taking that you know another step. And we're not going to talk about ghost ships. We're going to talk about haunted ships. Yep. And there are plenty of them. Oh, yeah. There, in fact, there are so many of them, we can't talk about all of them. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but what we did is we took five of what is considered some of the most haunted ships. And we're going to give you some of the history of the ship. Um, and and the age of the ship plays a big part, you know, whether it was in a war, you know, it also plays a big part in, in how haunted it may or may not be. Um, but these five ships we're going to talk about tonight have a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's not just a, a random sighting or some weird noises. Um, you know, some of these places are as haunted as any of the the hotels or hospitals or former uh, asylums that we've discussed on the show in the past. Oh yeah, and uh, it, we'll we'll touch on some of these had so much history that Matt and I were culling this down as much as possible, and we'll we'll discuss those when we get to them. But I mean, chock full of information about these things. So. First, like we always say, go check our sources. There's a ton of sources for this episode, but if you want to get that information that we can't cover, then go to our sources and go there and you can get all the history you want about these ships, Um, especially some of the older ones that we're going to talk about. They had hundreds of years of service that we just can't cover. So go check our sources down in the bottom of the show notes and 
go continue that research if it interests you. So we need to, like Matt was saying, take a look at this history because it's fascinating. And we're going to go one by one on these ships because it's so interesting. We want to cover them as thoroughly as we can in this format. Um, this this is not a going to be a multi-part episode, so we did have to call it down, like I said. But we want to first look at the USS Lexington. And the USS Lexington was one of many ships that was commissioned in the dawn of World War II. And it was sent to the initial raids on Tarawa and uh, Wake in the fall of 1943. Now, Lexington, Lexington also helped in the campaigns of the Gilbert Islands and the battle against the Japanese in the Marshall Islands. In December of that year, the ship was hit by a night attack, forcing her to return to the shipyard for two months of repairs. The USS Lexington was back on duty in early 1944 and was involved in many Pacific combats during the following months. Lexington went home in 1945 after the two Iwo Jima invasion uh, invasions for an overhaul and then returned in July and August to help with the end of the Pacific War. In December, the USS Lexington was sent home and was then decommissioned in Bremerton, Washington in 1947. She sat in, quote, mothballs for six years, not literal mothballs, but wouldn't you know. that be crazy? Yeah, I had this <laughs> big old crate of mothballs with a battleship shoved in there. What? Well, like 400 billion mothballs. <laughs> yeah. At a minimum, 400 billion. <laughs> um, but she sat there for six years and then underwent major modernizations that were completed in 1955. And she was recommissioned as an attack aircraft carrier. She made five deployments to the Western Pacific up until 1961 and then was transferred to the Atlantic for 30 years after that, the USS Lexington operated in the Gulf of Mexico as a training vessel and then was decommissioned in 1991. She was transferred to a private organization and was turned into a museum ship in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1992. Yeah, so, you know, it, it saw a lot of action. And, uh, it I mean, it, it's really got a unique history. In fact... The Japanese reported that the Lexington had been sunk no less than four times. <laughs> okay. And it was still out there. But each time. Like a weeble she come, wobble. She kept yeah, coming back. She comes back to fight. Um, and this caused the propagandist Tokyo Rose to nickname the Lexington the Blue Ghost. Now, the name is a tribute to the ship and the crew and the air groups that served aboard. But here's an interesting fact about that. The Lexington was not camouflaged. And right. at, the, at the time, the ships had this complex design of geographic shapes and different colors that made them a little bit more difficult to spot from the air. Yeah, you or, couldn't you see know, like the beginning, level. the beginning of the ship or the yeah. end of the ship. You didn't know where you were in the ship, so it was hard for missiles to hit it or submarines yeah. to be able to shoot anything right. at it. That's right. Um, but the uh, the Lexington was commissioned for battle before it could be painted, mm -hmm. so it appears blue. Yep. Um. Which, you know, was where the where the nickname came from. You would think blue would be the best camouflage for the ocean. I would think so, too. But if you ever if you look at some of the pictures of what this camouflage look like, it's 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 kind of random. But when you're at a distance, it does kind of give the appearance of water and wave crests and things mm -hmm. like that, that it, it's not like. It's not like Vero Beach, you know, it's got like waves painted <laughs> on the side of a building. I mean, it's 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 abstract, but at a distance, it does kind of give that appearance and it makes it kind of blend in yeah. uh, it, with, the, with the ocean. Don't think camo like real tree. 
So if you're, right. if, <laughs> it's, just some, it's not a mossy oak boat, yeah, right. You know, it, rolling around <laughs> out there. If you're redneck like Matt and I, you hear camo and you're like, oh, they got some real tree on yeah. that boat. Yeah, looking right. like leaves in the forest. No, it's not that kind of camo. Yeah, that's that's why when I was a kid, I always wondered why the planes were 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 camouflaged. I was mm-hmm. like, why aren't they just all painted blue with some clouds on them? Yeah, exactly. But but I learned later that it was. For when they're sitting on the ground is why they yeah. camouflage them. <laughs> yeah. Well, and camouflage is like, oh, not. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Camouflage is not necessarily um, always like tree and limb camouflage. Right. Camouflage. Um, I had to learn this too years ago when I was a kid was uh, camouflage means just hidden. Like yeah. you, you blend into your surroundings. So. Yeah. Arctic camo, you know, there's desert camo, there's all sorts of camo. And growing up, I just thought of the military green camo, like from the Vietnam War. That was when yeah. somebody said camo, that's what popped into my head. And so camo for this is weird, erratic shapes and everything yeah. that break up the outline of the vessel. You know, as if we aren't on a big enough tangent, I always thought that Arctic camo was was bad. I mean, it was, it was really cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. I, know. I, I don't know why I, yep. I just did. I thought, man, that looks cool. You know, I know, I know <laughs> I'm not cool enough to pull off wearing camo. So I don't oh, no. but <laughs> oh, oh no, no, no. Only time I, don't, I, I don't wear, <laughs> only time I wear camo is if I do need to hide in the woods and that's not often. My, my, my daughter's got a bunch of camo stuff because their high school mascot was the commandos. Oh, yeah. And so camo was kind of a part of their color scheme. You, know? you couldn't see anybody in the stands. That's right. It looked like empty stands. <laughs> it was empty. Where's all that <laughs> noise coming from? Yeah. yeah anyway. Anyway. Um, mo- moving on. So Charles Rusty Russell who is director of operations and exhibits on the USS Lexington said that the museum receives hundreds of reports of supernatural activity every year. Now, Rusty recounts one event by saying, I always use a ballpoint pen. And over the course of a few weeks, I lost about six pen caps off my desk. Now, the day I lost the sixth pen cap, I turned over my office looking for them. My office was spotless by the time I was through and I never found them. He said it the next day returns to his office and found all six pen caps laying side by side right in front of his computer keyboard. Hmm. That's weird. Yeah. You know, but I'm like, damn, don't. Don't take my pen cap. I mean, yeah, that, no that would annoy the snot out of me. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> you know, and then decide you're going to get them all back when I finally get upset about it. Now, Renee Mereda, the museum's education coordinator, said officials have heard from sh- uh, from security officers who have reported running in the hangar bay around 3 a.m. And she says the damage control officer said he didn't see anything on the security cameras and went to see where the noise was coming from. He said that was when he witnessed shadow figures running around in chaos. Oh, wild. And then she says the officer never came back. Now, when you read when you read it like it's written, it makes it sound like he just vanished. But that I think it scared him enough that yeah. he didn't he didn't want to keep. Keep at it. Yeah, so. it's not like he didn't come back from checking out the <laughs> shadow figures. This mass chaos of shadow figures just absorbed him. Yeah, exactly. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. <laughs> I have a feeling they would have talked a lot more about that if that would have been the case. Yep, I think uh, so. Now, Bill Miller, who's a volunteer and paranormal tour guide on the Lexington, said he believes what officers are witnessing at night are sailors running for cover after a torpedo attack. Hit after a torpedo attack hit the ship in Hangar Bay Three, which is where they hear the running at night. He said they're constantly doing the same thing over and over again, maintaining the ship. Um, he said this was their home, and they don't want to go anywhere else. 
Now, it makes sense. I it mean, it does make sense. It, it does make sense, and it, it goes to that stone tape theory we've talked about so many yep. times before. It's yep. just, you know, a, a an attack while you're in the service on board a ship. That's a big traumatic event, and if you were unfortunate enough to lose your life in that attack, then it would be reasonable to think there's a chance that there was enough energy for that spirit to keep replaying that event over and over and over again. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. The amount of energy that would be built up in the walls of these vessels from all of the battles that they've been in, that stressful energy, if it does hold the paranormal or give juice to the paranormal like we've talked about before that would be something i think that would cause a lot of spirit activity or or at least spirits to hang around yeah i agree now among the most famous sightings uh are a sailor dressed in uniform helping lost guests find their way back to the deck and a sailor in the engine room giving a lecture on how the turbines work before he vanishes into thin air. Hmm. Now, he's nicknamed Charlie, and his naval uniform and detailed ship tours make him one of the best tour guides on the ship, except there is no tour guide in uniform named Charlie. Wow. And 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 this whole idea of a of a spirit acting as a tour guide it comes up more than once on different ships. It's kind of funny. That is cool. But you know, you think about it. Somebody that served on a ship, I mean, that's a point of pride. I mean, they're they're proud of their ship. And you know, why not be the same way? You know, in death as they were in life. Yep. Now, there is a point on the Lexington that's marked by the Japanese flag, and this is where a kamikaze pilot crashed on deck, and the ghost of a Japanese pilot has been reportedly seen by tourists more than once standing alongside another American crewman. Screams and cries also accompany these apparitions, as well as the sounds of artillery and unexplained smells now, the only thing I can think of that they may be smelling would be like gunpowder. Yeah, um, or fuel in yeah, some way. Yeah, fuel, sure. You know, n- not necessarily pleasant smells. It doesn't go into details about what's reported, but you maybe, know, they, they wouldn't have any reason to be smelling that at the time. Right. Maybe the unpleasant smells is like ghost farts from the mess hall or something. <laughs> More beans, Mr. Taggart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, they uh, ship food can sometimes be rough. So, oh, I can imagine military food in general. Yeah. Now, the museum's executive director, Steve Banta, says that there are far too many experiences aboard the Lexington for there not to be some legitimacy to it. Yeah. And you're just report after report after report pretty much confirms that the Lexington is haunted. Yeah, which is cool. I mean, the the amount that you get on any of these vessels for such a... It, I, they're huge, don't get me wrong, but for such a small area, confined area like a, a ship is fascinating to me. That's right. So the next one we want to cover is the USS Constitution. Now... This is one that one of the couple that we had a ton of information for, so I may skip around a little bit. But the USS Constitution is the oldest commissioned warship in the world that's still afloat. It's nicknamed Old Ironsides. She is today birthed in Boston and is known as, quote, America's Ship of State, end quote. Her story illuminates much about the U.S. Navy during the nation's first hundred years. Constitution was laid down in Boston on November 1st, 1794, one of the first six 44 gun frigates authorized for the U.S. Navy. Her launching occurred on September 20th, 1797, but she stalled partway down the ways. 
She finally reached water October 21st, 1797. After a period of fitting out, the Constitution traveled with Captain Samuel Nicholson to the Caribbean during the Quasi-War with France. Constitution captured her first prize on September 8, 1798, the French ship Niger off Charleston. She then spent the next two years patrolling around the West Indies. She stopped several French ships and won a sailing competition against the British HMS Santa Margarita. She returned to Boston in the summer of 1801. I had a Santa Margarita one time. Yeah, salted rim. Salted rim with a little hat on it. You was know, it and frozen it was, or on ice? Yeah, it was frozen. Uh, it had uh, had red and white swirls in it where it was like, I like lime it. and strawberry. I like it. <laughs> Old Santa Margarita. There. I'm going to try to make one of those this year. Just fitting to have a Santa Margarita in Texas. Because it'll right. be 80 degrees in Christmas. so <laughs> Exactly. So Constitution returned to sea in August 1803 as the flagship for Captain Edward Preble, bound for the Mediterranean and operations against the Barbary pirates in North Africa. After helping rescue impounded ships in Tangier in October 1803, Preble's squadron suffered a blow when Philadelphia ran aground at Tripoli and was captured with her crew. Stephen Decatur burned Philadelphia on February 16, 1804, but a larger attack on Tripoli that summer, which Constitution assisted by bombarding the outer defenses, proved abortive. Now, Constitution blockaded Tripoli, capturing three ships in the process. Commodore Samuel Barron took command and directed a landing expedition to Derna, which today is in eastern Libya between Benghazi and the Egyptian border, after which the Tripolitanians, Tripolitanians? Man, that's rough. (laughs) That's the best I'm going to get. The Tripolitanians concluded a peace aboard Constitution on June 3rd, 1805. Constitution spent the next two years cruising the Mediterranean. Captain Hugh Campbell assumed command in 1806. The Chesapeake Leopard incident in 1807 delayed her relief, and Campbell narrowly averted a mutiny by his homesick crew. Constitution arrived back in Boston in October 1807, 50 months after her departure. Can you Shoot. imagine being on on a ship for 50 months? That would cause you to mutiny right there. That's right. I can imagine it. And I don't like it. Yeah, right. Now, the War of 1812, uh, that outbreak found Constitution in port under Commodore Isaac Hull. Hull sailed in early July to join in an assembling U.S. squadron near New York. Lookout sighted a squadron off Egg Harbor, New Jersey, on July 17th, but quickly determined it was British. The British gave chase, and in very calm winds, it looked like Constitution would be captured. Hull wet the sails to catch all gusts, put out boats to tow the ship, and even used a kedge, used the kedge anchors to winch her along. The British drew close a few times to trade fire, but both sides shot Uh, Both sides' shots fell wide. Finally, a desperate hull pumped over much of the ship's drinking water, which lightened Constitution enough that she was able to escape. Man. It's crazy. Um, We'll go a little bit more here on it. After a short stop in Boston to resupply, Hull put to sea again on August 2nd. Over the next two weeks, Constitution took three prizes in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. On August 19th, she ran across the British frigate Gruyere, who accepted battle, and in a short and sharp engagement, Constitution wrecked Gruyere while suffering only slight damage herself. The victory gave rise to the comment, her sides are made of iron, and her nickname, Old Ironsides. She had many, many other missions and and many, many miles after that, but We don't have time to cover them all, so we're going to skip ahead just a little bit. Um, And it says, although Constitution has not seen active service for decades, Old Ironsides 
has carried forward. In 1940, Major General Bruce Magruder saw a picture of Constitution and decided her nickname offered suitable inspiration for the U.S. Army's new 1st Armored Division. This incarnation of Old Ironsides served in Tunisia, Italy, Germany, Vietnam, and the Middle East and is currently stationed in Fort Bliss, Texas. Today, Constitution remains in commission as a U.S. Navy warship open for tours in Boston. Yeah, and I'm telling you, if you ever want some fascinating reading, if 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 military books are your thing, stories about these old naval battles, especially when they're uh, with sailing ships, they are they are incredible. I mean, the, yeah. the things these captains would come up with to get an edge in battle or to get away. Yeah, it's it's just it's fascinating to me what yep. what these what these guys were able to come up with and, and just to get that that edge. All I need is a little bit of an edge. I need to get mm-hmm. a little bit closer and we can win this. It's it's incredible. Yep. So if if that's kind of your thing, check out some of those. Um, check out some of the, some of the books about old naval battles you know absolutely really really good reading yeah what they uh, were able to get their ships to do was fascinating oh yeah but just like the lexington um the constitution had some sailors that didn't want to leave right. um not as many stories as there were with the lexington but the ones that you have are are pretty incredible um, there is a story about a Boy Scout troop who spent the night aboard the ship in 1997. Now, as the other scouts slept, one boy was awakened before dawn by a sailor in period clothing. Now, the story says the sailor was frantic, and the boy said the sailor told him that it was his turn to pull watch duty and that he must hurry topside. The sailor's clothes were ragged and dirty, the boy said, but he thought nothing of it and hurried sleepily to his post. Now, hours later, as the sun was coming up, the other uh, scouts woke up and asked him what he was doing. Yeah. And he told his story, and a lot of them already knew before he finished that that sailor had been a ghost. Yeah, that's wild. Now, when the USS Constitution sailed to commemorate its quote unquote birthday and the anniversary of the battle with the HMS uh, Guerrero, the crew would see objects roll across the deck for n- no reason at all, including a 24 pound cannonball that rolled back and forth like a cannonball wouldn't normally do. Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, you know, you got a heavy cannonball. It if it's gonna roll, it's gonna roll in a pattern, and it's not gonna change direction very quickly. Yep. Uh, it's gonna build up a lot of momentum. But apparently, that's exactly what they saw: is this ball just kind of rolling around of its own accord, like it was on like high wave seas or something. Yeah, like it was one of those like remote control droid things. You know, you hmm. can get in control with your phone. You know, yeah, <laughs> just rolling around. That's what it was doing. At 24 pounds, it doesn't normally do that. No, that's not a gust of wind. Now, this is an interesting story about the USS Constitution that I came around. There is a model of the Constitution that sits in the National Museum of the United States Navy. Now, the model is dubbed the Black Constitution or simply the Black Ship. And this model is once sat in the office of John F. Kennedy in the White House. Now, it was later displayed in the office of White House Press Secretary James Brady, who uh, served under Reagan, I believe. Now, after Brady's shooting and the link to Kennedy and the potential of bad luck coming to whoever used this model in their office, led the White House to return it to the museum. (laughs) And we would like to return this. No one wants to take the risk of having it displayed in their office. This ship has gotten two people shot. Please take (laughs) it back. 
So not so much that the ship may have had a curse on it, but the model might have. Yeah, so, right. So you can still see this model at the at the National Museum of the United States Navy. I just would suggest maybe not buying a model of the Constitution. <laughs> just, yeah, just when you're looking for old Navy ships to 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 have a model, just mark the Constitution off your list. <laughs> Get the Lexington or something. <laughs> That's right. There's there's plenty others to choose from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so the next ship we got coming up is the USS Salem. Now, it was ordered by the U.S. Navy on the 14th of June, 1943. USS Salem, CA-139, was laid down on July 4th, 1945 at the Bethlehem Steel Company's Quincy Yard in Quincy, Massachusetts, launched on March 25th, 1947. She was commissioned at the Boston Navy Yard on May 14th, 1949. USS Salem served a distinguished 10-year career as flagship of the U.S. 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean and the 2nd Fleet in the Atlantic. During her career, she served as host to such notables as the U.S. Ambassador to Spain, John D. Lodge, the Honorable Thomas S. Gates, Undersecretary of the Navy, Admiral Arley A. Burke, USN Chief of Naval Operations, the Shah of Iran, the President of Lebanon, and the King and Queen of Greece. Although Salem never fired her mighty guns in anger, her very presence served as a stimulus for peace during those troubled times that came to be called the Cold War. She served as a lady of diplomacy rather than as a means of exerting brute force. When USS Salem was decommissioned on January 30th, 1959 and joined the Atlantic Reserve Fleet at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president of the United States and everyone was watching I Love Lucy on their television. So that kind of gives you a a time frame there. Um, Lucy and Eisenhower. Um, This says in October of 1994, Salem once again made her way north to her birthplace in Quincy, where she is now the centerpiece of the United States Naval and Shipbuilding Museum. On May 14, 1995, 46 years to the day since her original commissioning, Salem was recommissioned, this time as a member of the Historic Naval Ships Association. She now serves her country once again with her new mission of teaching people of all generations our nation's rich history of shipbuilding and naval duty. So that I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. That they recommissioned yeah. her and and it's basically a, a teaching ship now. Yeah, I the the stories and the history and the just the 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 mystique is is what I'm looking for. The mystique of these ships. Yeah. And and just the the emotion that's poured into them and how they are just revered as heroes themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not just the men that served aboard, but the ship itself is often hailed as a hero. I, I I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, it's just, it, it just makes the history so much more rich and, and worthy. Um, but, much like the other ones, USS Salem, even though it wasn't, you know, involved in any conflict, it has its share of of spirit activity. Now, people that have taken the tour of the USS Salem have heard footsteps in multiple areas. When they turn to see who's walking with them, no one is there. Now, this is one of those eerie occurrences that's very, very common uh, and and is reported by many, many tour groups uh, that come through there. All right, Adam, you know, and I imagine most of our listeners know by now that one of my all-time favorite midnight snacks is cereal. Oh, yeah. But I'm I'm at an age where I know that I shouldn't get up at midnight and eat a bowl of sugary 
cereal. It's just not the healthy thing for me to do. Right. But Magic Spoon has changed all that. Now, you know, I'm always trying to watch my carbs, the sugar, the unhealthy food, and cereal was on that list. Mm -hmm. But with Magic Spoon, you can get a healthy breakfast cereal that you don't have to feel guilty about. That's right, because it has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, and only 140 calories per serving. And it's great because whatever diet you're on, you can still eat cereal because it's keto-friendly, it's gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. So whatever new diet you're trying out, you can eat this cereal still, which is great because I did the the keto diet for a while. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, you did that I, too. I've done it, yeah. And uh, that sucks because you can't have your cereal or anything, so... <laughs> Uh, it, it was it was tough, but I didn't have Magic Spoon back then. But I do now, so I, I might try it again. And the cool thing is you can build your own box of cereals. So they have available flavors that you can choose from to build your own box. And they are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. And as I've said before, I, I love that maple waffle. It really does taste like maple syrup with a little bit of that waffle in the back it's great yeah it it's my favorite along with the cinnamon um because my favorite breakfast cereal is a cinnamon based cereal and this is a fantastic replacement that's much healthier right it is um you know they say too that if you mix the peanut butter and the cocoa together you get kind of a peanut butter cup flavor and it's true so if you like me and you like peanut butter cups, that's the way to go. Um, but our listeners can go to magicspoon.com slash grave to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure to use our promo code grave at checkout. That's G-R-A-V-E. And you can save $5 off your order. Yeah. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash grave and use the code GRAVE, G-R-A-V-E, to get $5 off. Voices have also been heard drifting through the ship, and it says that they're they're very mysterious and often incoherent. So you hear the voice, you may not be able to understand what it says, but it's got this, you know you're not hearing another tour group that's ahead of you. Right. I mean, it's, it's just, it's different. Now, in the mess hall, there is an ominous figure of a dark haired Greek girl. And along with her is a violent, growling hellhound. Oh, wow. Now, chairs have been pulled out, tossed across the room. Loud, unexplained banging sounds have been heard. The latches have been slammed when no one is around. And the drill in the empty dentist's office has even been heard turning on. Oh, wow. Yeah, really weird. That's not a good sound. Yeah. Now, they have a very unique spirit called the Burning Man. And the Burning Man has been described as a, as a specter who, quote, smells like death. He is thought to be one of like the Like most many. people who go to the Burning Man Festival. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you end up smells, smelling like smells death. Smells like after. death. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Smells like death and hippies. What's going on? (laughs) Smells like feet and buttholes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, But but he is thought to be one of the many who unfortunately succumbed to their fatal fourth degree burns aboard the ship. Ghost tours often spot the burning man in the same room where the ship's morgue once stood 
which is believed to be where he died. Hmm. Now, the printer at the museum, Peter Bloomberg, has had his own paranormal experiences. He said a mysterious figure appeared before him down one of the ship's dark hallways. It stared at him, then descended the staircase and left him kind of shocked standing in this dark hall. Yeah. Right. Wait. What happened? Um, (laughs) It's also been said that a woman has been recorded screaming from the hospital's operating room. Her pleas to, quote, get it out were captured on an electronic voice phenomena device. Now, it is believed that this is the residual of a woman who was giving birth on Mm -hmm. the ship. How often does that happen? (laughs) Probably more than we know. I'm sure it does, but that, that seems kind of odd. You know, yeah. not not that you wouldn't have a, a, you know, a female crew member, but would you really have one that's pregnant? I don't know. Back back then, it, it would seem less likely nowadays um, pregnant women can serve for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, but back then, I, I don't I don't know. But, you know, she was used to ship dignitaries and and ambassadors and stuff around so true enough it it's possible that it's from something like that one of her missions back and forth carrying dignitaries or whatever sure yeah that makes sense makes sense a mysterious figure has been witnessed roaming the machinery room and furniture inexplicably moves about in empty rooms so I, what that's saying is yeah, they're here, they're, they will hear chairs and things scooting across the floor in a room that doesn't have any furniture in it. Yeah, and which is weird. Yeah. Now, many have said they have felt the presence of someone behind them only to turn around and see that no one is there. Now, it's been said that very few people visit the ship without leaving with some story of an unexplained encounter. Now, when you tour the ship, it not only provides a glimpse into history, it's a chance to experience something really supernatural. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also known as one of the most haunted ships in the world, which, you know, as many haunted ships are out there that it's got a lot of competition. Oh, yeah. To carry that title um, among such a crowded room is pretty cool. Yeah. So. Next one we got is the USS Constellation. Now, a little preface on the Constellation here. There is history coming out of every orifice for the Constellation. It has three different iterations. Yep. Um, There are the two older ones, which we're going to talk about, but there's also a newer one uh, that was built and named the constellation in the sixties, but that's it's not a, the one. It's an aircraft carrier, right? Right, right. Uh, but that's not the one we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the one and two versions of it, which basically the same one just rebuilt later. So we got quite a bit of history here to go through and quite a bit of skipping to do so that we don't spend 14 hours just discussing <laughs> the constellation. Now, the USS Constellation is a sloop of war, uh, the last sail-only warship designed and built by the United States Navy. She was built in 1854 using a small amount of material salvaged from the frigate USS Constellation, which had been disassembled the year before. She is now preserved as a museum ship in Baltimore, Maryland, and is a National Historic Landmark. For over 200 years, Constellation ships have navigated the world's oceans defending America's interest. In 1797, the USF Frigate Constellation was commissioned. This frigate's name originated from the flag of the Continental Congress. Because of her swift sailing speed and handling ability, USS USF Constellation soon became known as the, quote, Yankee Racehorse. 
1854, the Sloop of War constellation was commissioned to carry on famous constellation's name. This ship was heavily involved in finding and capturing slave trade ships and trading, uh, training for brave seamen. Following the Sloop of War in 1961, the aircraft carrier constellation was built, known as America's flagship. She continued tradition, as always, being first to answer her nation's call. Now, the first constellation initially was a frigate designed by naval constructors Joshua Humphreys and Hosea Fox. However, plans were later altered in its execution by builder David Stodder, a superintendent of shipbuilding. Captain Thomas Truxton, uh, and after the construction of Constellation was finished at Sterrett Shipyard in Baltimore, Maryland, she launched on September 7, 1797. That's my birthday just a few hundred years before. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So... Every 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 September seventh, when I celebrate my birthday, I'm also going to celebrate the launching of the constellation. Yeah, why not? I think from now on. Now, constellation convoyed American uh, merchantmen at the outset from June through August 1798 before sailing for the West Indies to protect United States commerce. Under the command of Captain Thomas Truxton, she sailed for the Caribbean in December 1798. Subsequently, on February 9, 1799, the Constellation captured, captured a French 40-gun frigate, La Insurgente, in battle off Nevis, West Indies. In a hard-fought victory, she brought her prize into port. In the succeeding months, Constellation additionally encountered and seized two French privateers, Diligent and Union. On the evening of February 1st, 1800, the Constellation engaged with a 52-gun frigate, the Vengeance, in a lengthy, furious battle. Vengeance twice struck her colors, lowered her flag in surrender, is what that means, and was close to sinking. However, with a stroke of luck, Vengeance utilized the darkness of the night to escape from Constellation, who was unable to pursue further because of her loss of the main, uh, the main mast. Now, there's so much history that yeah. I'm going to bounce a little bit here um, ahead. Now, ultimately, laid up in ordinary at Norfolk, Virginia, and that just means laid up in ordinary basically means they're, um, they're put for repairs and, and storage and stuff like that. So um, if you're reading history about ships and you see they're laid up in ordinary, that's what that means. Um, but... Uh, laid up in ordinary at Nor Norfolk, Virginia from 1845 to 1853, Constellation was broken up there in 1853. Now let's look at the second iteration of the Constellation. The second Constellation was a sloop designed by John Linthal and constructed at the Norfolk Navy Yard in Virginia, commissioned on July 28, 1855. This sloop later departed under Captain Charles H. Bell for a three-year cruise with the Mediterranean Squadron to protect American interest. Constellation was detached from the Mediterranean Squadron on April 17, 1858, after a brief cruise in Cuban waters, where she safeguarded American commerce against unlawful search on the high seas. She later returned to the New York Navy Yard on June 5, 1858, and was then decommissioned at Boston on August 13th of the same year. Now, re-entering active service in June 1859 as flagship of the U.S. Africa Squadron, Constellation took station off the mouth of the Congo River on November 21st, 1859. Now, she captured the Brig Delicia uh, during the mid-watch on December 21st, 1859. It says, quote, without colors or papers to show her nationality, completely fitted in all respects for the immediate embarkation of slaves. So basically, she captured and stopped a ship that was designed for shipping Sl slaves from slave Africa. Slave trading, yeah. Yep, exactly. So she did a good service there. Not that... All the rest of these haven't been good service, but um, we need to skip ahead a little bit. Um, I'm leaving out a bunch for time's sake. So like we said in the beginning, go check our sources if you want to get all the rest of this. 
Now, on May 15, 1926, Constellation was towed to Philadelphia and moored alongside the second line light cruiser Olympia CL-15, which had been Admiral George Dewey's flagship at the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. Constellation made her last public appearance as a commissioned U.S. Navy ship during the ceremonies accompanying the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which was on July 4, 1926. After a short dry docking at Philadelphia, that's not a dirty thing. Dry docking is pulled out of water. That's <laughs> Only you would do that. It's not yeah, dirty. You know. <laughs> well, you know, some people out there think like me. And they heard dry docking, and it went a weird direction. So I just had to make sure they knew we didn't change the format of our show. It's still PG. So after this not dirty short dry docking at Philadelphia, she was towed back to Newport in November. In 1968, the ship was relocated to the Inner Harbor to serve as the centerpiece of the city's revitalization effort. Lack of maintenance funds, however, resulted in the ship having a 36-inch hog in her keel, a severely damaged structure, and significant dry rot that lasted over the next two decades. In 1994, Constellation's rigging was removed and she was closed to the public. A newly established Constellation Foundation raised the funds needed for a major renovation project on the ship. After the hull uh, of renovations, the repaired Sloop of War returned to her permanent berth in Baltimore's Inner Harbor on July 2nd, 1999. All right. So as we as we go along, you're noticing that each one of these ships has a, a, a little bit more activity. And the Constellation is is definitely one of the more active ships we looked at. With her history, that is not surprising because no. I left out several hundred years worth of activity. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it it, it was it was pretty impressive um, the the ship's accomplishments, but it it also saw a, a lot of action, and with all that action, it's it's going to see a lot of death, mm-hmm. a lot of emotion, and it's it's kind of you know, left some spiritual residue uh, sure, on, yeah. on the constellation. Now, one of the ghosts that is said to haunt her is that of Neil Harvey. Now, Neil Harvey was a crew member who actually fell asleep while on watch. What a jerk. Yeah, you don't do that. <laughs> now, he is sometimes seen on the Orlop deck below the main deck now in 19 and 19 in 1799 he was court-martialed for cowardice he had left his assigned station at his gun in fear during a battle with the french on february 5th 1799 where the 36 gun french frigate the insurgente was engaged and captured now as a result of being convicted not only of being a coward, but also being a traitor, Lieutenant Starrett started off Harvey's punishment by sticking him with his sword. Oh, wow. Now, he was wounded, but he was still alive. And Harvey was executed in what I learned was a traditional way. I thought this was just crazy brutal, but it was actually traditional. Any any guesses on how he was uh, executed? Uh, either plank walking or hanging from a mast. B- both pretty terrible, but no. This this way this execution method was used both by the British and Americans in this in this era. He was tied in front of a cannon. And blown to bits. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was by order of Captain Thomas Truxton himself. Wow. My other guess was keel hauling. Keel hauling. But yeah. I, yeah. I thought he wouldn't, he wouldn't have said 
he didn't know it's common practice because we have the the saying you'll be keel hauled but i had no idea that they did that that yeah. form of execution i mean to when i first when i first came across this um i thought this was just you know we we had a traitor and a yeah. coward on our ship you know we we're going to take care of this person you know in the most brutal way possible mm. no it was traditional yeah everybody did that that's wild and keel hauling i'm not sure but i it was i'm thinking it was a british thing because there were there were a lot of pirates who were mm-hmm. supposedly keel hauled and if you don't know what that is you ought to look it up it's it's pretty horrible they would, that's pretty brutal too they would they would tie they would tie uh the prisoner up and then drag him across the bottom of the ship's hull through the mm-hmm. water and then bring him up the other side you may think well that sounds pretty terrible but ha- well those ships were covered in barnacles yep and those barnacles they they're like glass man yeah they're sharp they have sharp pointy you know appendages sticking off of them you know like like shells and they they don't want things to eat them so they're gonna yeah that's how they protect themselves you. and they're dragging your body across all that through that seawater and mm-hmm. up the other side so now yep. you're all so, cut up covered in salt water it's miserable and, it's like uh, dragging you through uh, broken glass yeah. and then dumping salt on you sure. all at the same time. Yeah, terrible. Terrible. But this is pretty bad, too. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to be blown up in front of a cannon either. You're sitting there tied to that cannon just waiting on what's happening. You know, The only it, thing I can say is at least it's quicker than keel hauling. That's true. That's true. It, it, it would be fast. Yep. Now... Captain Truxton's ghost is also said to haunt the constellation, and he may be the officer that's uh, reportedly seen in an old Navy uniform who consists trying to blow people up with a cannon, (laughs) running around poking people with swords and going time to the cannon. (laughs) (laughs) But but Captain Truxton's ghost consistently makes appearances on the forecastle deck. Now. He supposedly loved this ship, and it seems that he didn't ever want to leave. Lieutenant Commander Alan Ross Broham. I'm assuming that's Broham and not Broham. Maybe. Yeah, don't say Broham. That sounds like, <laughs> hey, what's up, Broham? <laughs> say Broham. It's two. Okay. So even, we'll go with Even Broham. if it's not. Yeah, even if it is Broham, we can't call him Broham on this show. <laughs> now, now, uh, now, Broham, while on board the Pike, took a picture of one entity of an 18th or 19th century officer that was described as having a bluish white radiancy, wearing an old fashioned uniform with gold stripes on his trousers, wearing a cocked hat and carrying a sword. All right, so that photograph was taken from the Pike, which uh, was a Navy submarine, which was moored next to the Constellation. Now, people on board the, the Pike reported seeing ghost lights, hearing strange noises, and even saw apparitions walking and floating around the ship's deck. So these were actually witnessed from right beside the Constellation. Hmm. Now, this next this next spirit is, is that of Carl Hansen. Now, he was the ship's 20th century watchman. Okay, so after the constellation uh, was was decommissioned and docked, he served as the watchman until 1965. Now, they said that Hansen adored the ship and he had a strong emotional bond to the constellation. And in his younger days, he was a Royal Navy cook, which made him an old sailor himself. Now, his ghost likes to play cards and will cheerfully give tours to unsuspecting people, such as a priest who thought he was a real person. Now, at a Sea Scout Halloween party, 
he sat next to a young girl and actually smiled at her. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, that's creepy. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about in, in some of these cases, intelligent hauntings. They interact with the living. I mean, especially, mm-hmm. and I told you earlier, these, this idea of a spirit taking on the role of a tour guide, um, it yep. comes up. It, it, it comes up again on the constellation. Now, psychic Sybil Leak says that she has felt the presence of the spirit of an 11 year old boy on the constellation. Now, the boy was supposedly the surgeon's assistant uh, in, in between 1820 and 1822. Now, he was murdered by two other sailors with a knife in the cockpit of the Orlop deck. Now, this is strictly according to to this a, a psychic, uh, you know, Sybil Leak. And, um, but she's done a lot of investigating aboard the Constellation. Now, during an episode of the Travel Channel's The Holzer Files, investigators document footsteps and knockings, swaying hammocks below deck, and mysterious recordings. There's even a bite mark on one of the investigators, um, who, and they had a camera on hand to record the moment when some unseen force grips his arm and leaves the red mark behind. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's actual, you know, photograph and video evidence of the hauntings aboard the USS Constellation. And it's cool to go and, and look up images of these ships, but when you see the Constellation, it's one of the coolest looking ones. I mean, it's yeah. just... Yeah. Something else. And you, and you look at it and you go, hey, if there was going to be a haunted ship, I bet it's this one. <laughs> I mean, it just has that appearance. Uh, right. Really, really cool. It, it, it reminds me of a pirate ship. I mean, it really does. It's It's got that look to it. Yeah. And it, it, you're right. The, the, the look of a pirate ship, you know it when you see it. And something that has that appearance and then has worked for the U S Navy and all. It's just, I mean, the history just Mm -hmm. oozing from this ship is incredible. Yeah. So it, it's time to, uh, to move to the other side of the pond and it is, and, and, and talk about, we, we couldn't, we couldn't talk about haunted ships without talking about this one. Well, we could, but we might get yelled at. So we, <laughs> we don't want to get yelled at. We 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 would have we we would have left out a a major part of of, of uh, haunted ships. I'm telling you. Right, right. So let's talk about the RMS Queen Mary. So I'm not going to do the whole thing talking like this. I was gonna say, I, I might be impressive. able to. She locked me to try. Yeah, it's impressive. So well, I appreciate that. Is is so would that be would that be Cockney? Is that what that is? It's like a bad Cockney mixed with Australian is what it is. <laughs> it's all right. So listen, we've got geographically we, it's wild. I don't know. We we've got a lot of listeners in the UK. And and That's right. some some of them have been with us from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. I want to know. I want you to tell us in the Facebook group. How how good is Adam's uh, uh, British accent here? I mean, I want. That's I, right. I'd, I'd like to be know, nice. I, I think it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to our American ears, it's not too bad. But be nice when you tell me how horrible it really is. And if there's a an area that I might be closer to, let me know. Like, is it northern? Is it not even in England anywhere? <laughs> Let me know. Uh, it's it, it, it's yeah, it's like some kind of crazy hybrid, but I like it. I like it. <laughs> it it's Adam British is what it's, it is. It, it's it, it's better than Kevin Costner's accent in uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> I can assure you of that. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> now the RMS Queen Mary uh, or the Royal Mail Ship Queen Mary 
was built in Clydebank, Scotland, under the ownership of Cunard White Star Line. Now, the White Star Line is the same one that did the Titanic. Yep. And I remember this because I helped Michael with a school project on the Titanic not long ago. So, same builders that did the Titanic. Now, designed and equipped to be a transatlantic super ocean liner, she sailed in 1936 from England to New York City. For three years, her prestigious wealthy passengers included royalty, movie stars, statesmen, and prominent politicians who sailed in elegance and experienced the grand era of ocean liner travel. Which I would like, man, if I could time travel back, I would like to see what ocean liners were like in those yeah. days. The days of the RMS Queen Mary and the Titanic. And I mean, that would be fascinating. Uh, you you really, you look at it and you, you think, think about this. I mean, modern day cruise ships, you know, you're just, you're going out for three or four days a week. You're, you're popping into all these, um, you know, Caribbean islands and all the, you know, every, it's all, and there's so much, there's casinos and multiple pools and surf like a machine. floating city. It is, it is. But what's amazing is how much they had on board these line, these ocean liners, which would, would cross the ocean mm -hmm. and what, what luxuries they had in, in the era that we're, we're speaking about. Um, right. when you, when you look at the old, um, uh, the photos of the Titanic and you, you read about what was there, just like the queen Mary, you're just like, Holy Moses. Yeah. You know, the, we're, we're not, we're not talking about a, a cruise liner that was built in 2010. You know, mm -hmm. th this is, it, it is amazing what they had. So I'm with you, you know, that, that cross Atlantic trip, on one of these old ocean liners, it must have been just incredible. Oh yeah, it, it it'd be so fun to to be able to experience that once. Now this says World War II broke out late in 1939, and because of her speed, size, and technology, it was decided to retrofit the Queen Mary to serve as a troop ship. The elegant furnishings were stripped from the interior of the ship and stored in warehouses. During the conversion, much of the ship was painted navy gray, and she became known as the Gray Ghost. Now, Queen Mary transported over 15,000 men on many voyages, some uh, who were ill or injured from the battles of the war. Um, areas of the ship became a hospital on the water with doctors and nurses treating the troops. So we know that's going to cause some uh, residual hauntings mm -hmm. there. Um, at least 49 crew and passengers died during her years as a transatlantic super ocean liner. No one knows the number of war casualties who died on the ship as these records are sealed by the U.S. military. Um, again, more supernatural sludge being thrown mm -hmm. on the walls here. Now, after the war, the Queen Mary was returned to its status as a world-class transatlantic ocean liner. However, by 1960, air travel was becoming the pre preferred method of transportation. After years of financial difficulties, the Queen Mary was retired in 1967 and moved to Long Beach, California. As Queen Mary moved into her new role as a tourist attraction with restaurants, a museum, and event facility, there were rumors of ghosts and spirits that were roaming the ship. Yeah. All right. Now, like, like Adam said, at least 49 reported deaths on the ship. Um, and, and they, that doesn't even cover wartime death as Adam yeah. mentioned. So it's easy to believe that there are reported to be as many as 150 spirits roaming the ship. Now, I'd believe it. Yeah. One of the most haunted spots on the ship is the swimming pool where you can see wet footprints on deck, even though the pools are no longer used. You can hear splashing and laughing 
And some have even reported seeing a little girl who allegedly drowned in one of the pools. Now, another hot spot on the Queen Mary is the engine room, which was used in filming the Poseidon adventure. At different times in the ship's history, two men were crushed by the huge watertight door, and at least the most recent victim has been seen down in the engine room. Now, there are an incredible number of other paranormal occurrences on the Queen Mary, ranging from full-body apparitions to phones ringing with no one on the line, water running, and lights turning on and off without anyone being there. Hmm. Now, let's talk real quick about a new sponsor to Graveyard Tales, and that's Talkspace. Now, I know that there's a lot of fears that surround going and seeing a therapist or talking to somebody, you know, about working on your mental health, but you really shouldn't have any fears because... There, there is the fear of opening up to a stranger, but therapists are there. That's that's the reason they are here, is to talk to you about that. And there's the fear of, you know, are your family members going to judge you or whatever. But with Talkspace, meeting with a therapist to work on your mental health is just as helpful as hiring a personal trainer to work on your physical health. And the positive impact can be just as life-changing. Talkspace makes it possible to speak with a licensed therapist right from your phone, tablet, or computer. And unlike traditional therapy, you can message your therapist anytime via text, video, or voice. And it's 100% secure and stigma-free, which is the way therapy should be. And it's really cool that you can message them at any point. You can do a a face-to-face um, video call if you want to with them. That's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And and therapy can be so important for your your personal well being. And especially now, as we go into the holidays, there's a lot of people for a lot of reasons that this time of year is just it. It's not joyous. It mm-hmm. it's, it. it it brings about a lot of memories, a lot of pain and things like that. So being able to connect with someone who can listen and help you work through those things is probably the best present you could give yourself. And Talkspace makes it so easy for you to do that. If you've been with Graveyard Tales for any length of time, you know that Matt and I need therapy. So we absolutely we love Talkspace because of that. We we have problems that we need to talk to somebody about. That's you know, I mean, maybe your co-host makes fun of you all the time. You you can't talk to your co-host about that. You got to talk to a therapist. <laughs> Find a therapist. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Adam. Yeah, I did. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> now at Talkspace, your privacy and security are their number one priority. The app puts you in a private room with just you and your therapist. You can send messages 24-7 and get replies throughout the day. No need to wait for a weekly appointment. And facing obstacles that you have isn't easy. And you don't really win a prize for doing it alone. It's not like you get a medal for, hey, I made it through on my own. So get professional help getting through that and you'll be a lot better off if you do that we want to make sure that everybody knows that getting professional help isn't weird it's not weak it's smart if you need help go talk to somebody at Talkspace because sure your friend might know a thing or two or your co-host might understand something about a podcast but I you know I don't want them to help me work my way through personal problems That's why we have a licensed professional therapist at Talkspace. Yeah. So join Talkspace today and start moving forward with a single message. Just visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code GRAVE, that's G-R-A-V-E, at sign up. 
That's right. Just go to Talkspace.com, T-A-L-K-S-P-A-C-E.com, and you can get $100 off your first month when you use our promo code GRAVE, G-R-A-V-E, at sign up. Now, stateroom B340 was a problem long before the Queen Mary opened as a hotel. In 1948, a British third-class passenger, Walter J. Adamson, passed away in the room, and the details of his death are pretty much unknown. Now, later in 1966, a woman staying in the room reported that she was woken up when the bed covers were pulled off of her and she saw a man standing at the foot of the bed. She screamed and rang for the steward, but the man apparently vanished into thin air. Now, this whole pulling the covers thing, I mean, pulling them off, we've heard about that in other haunted hotels multiple times. Don't yank the covers off me. I mean, if you go stand there at the end of the bed, that's fine. It'll freak me out. Yeah. Just don't yank the damn covers off of me. <laughs> right. Right. Don't don't yank the covers off of me and don't tickle my foot and God. we'll be okay. Yeah, that would it's awful. You know. You tickle my foot, we got problems. Yeah, I can't I can't handle that. I, I you know, I get spooked enough when one of the kids I wake up in the night and they're standing right there beside me. But they don't yank the covers off. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so I'd be all right. Just stand there. Don't pull my covers. Mm-hmm. Now, years later, guests staying in that room have reported hearing someone knocking on the door in the middle of the night and seeing the bathroom lights mysteriously turn on. Even the hotel's maids started complaining that they would find the bathroom water running even when no one had been staying in the room for days. And one reported that the bed covers were pull off, pulled off right after she put them on. Hey, that's another thing. I, I hate it's I, I well hate's a strong word, but I do not like having to put the bed sheets back on the bed. Oh, I know. Okay, it's a pain, but you got to wash the sheets. So you know, I got to put them back on. If I'm one of those hotel maids and this is what I'm doing all day, every day, and I do a bed and then I come back in and some spirit has yanked all that sheets off the bed, oh, I'm going to be dude. pissed. Yeah, right. <laughs> so they complained. Yeah. They were like, hey, you got to do something about this ghost that's in B340. He's messing stuff up that I just finished. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, man, I would too. That I'd, I'd be complaining to my superiors yeah. about that. <laughs> So in 1989, two women were sent to clean the Mauritania room for a VIP reception. When they entered the room, they found a passenger sitting on a chair in the middle of the dance floor, and he didn't say a word. When a third woman came in to help with the cleaning, she remarked that the passenger was staring and asked her to move. Now, as the employees started to call security, the passenger faded away right in front of them. And wow. all three women reported seeing it at the same time. Now, that's that's crazy. That's man. one of those things that's really you, you hear a lot of these stories and it's always a single witness. But when you got mm-hmm. three witnesses all reporting the exact same thing, it definitely lends some credibility to this story. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Now, people have reported seeing a number of ghosts around the pool. As I mentioned the pool earlier, uh, a young woman in a tennis skirt walking downstairs and then disappearing behind a pillar. A woman in an old wedding gown next to the pool with a little boy in a suit. And a cloud of steam appearing out of nowhere, along with a little girl in a blue and white dress who disappears in an instant. Now, not only is the Queen Mary, uh, you know, one of the most haunted ships, it's also considered to be one of the most haunted hotels. So, yep. I mean, you know, to, to get a distinction, uh, you know, in both of those categories, like we said, it's got a lot, 
a lot. And I even commented at the beginning of the show uh, before we hit the record button. Uh, we could we could possibly do an entire show on just the hauntings that go on on the Queen Mary. And I, I remember we definitely could. I, I remember um, hearing an account, uh, a, a modern day account, you know, from just, you know, within the last five to ten years uh, from a couple who went and stayed uh, for kind of like a weekend getaway. And uh, as they were getting ready, you know, to go to dinner, um, the guy was just kind of stretched out on the bed and his wife was in the bathroom. And as he Mm -hmm. looks, there's like a full length mirror on the door and he can see like this old uh, sailor standing in the mirror and enough to where it looked like there was a guy standing in the bathroom with his wife. And so when he gets up and looks, there's nobody in there. And uh, it happened a couple of times and to the point where they were just kind of like, uh, let's go. <laughs> so, yeah, let's get a different room. And so they didn't stay, but they came back, but they didn't stay the night on there. They came back the next day, um, you know, to, to get to witness everything. But they were, they were pretty spooked and I would have been too. Oh yeah. But I mean, oh, yeah. you know, I, we might should do a, a full episode on the queen Mary. It's got enough. It's, it's definitely got, got a lot of, uh, paranormal activity going on mm-hmm. uh, and, and still operates as a hotel. Um, yep. So, you know, a, 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 that's, this is one of the, you know, you can visit all of these ships, um, but this one you can actually stay and, and, and hang out and really get a good opportunity to experience something um, more than you possibly would on just a tour. Right. Right. The longer you're in one place, the more opportunity you've got. Yeah. And so, like we said at the top of the show, we we picked these five because of the really great stories and the history behind them. Um, but there are so many, so many haunted ships out there. there it, it must be something about the water, um, uh, you know, whether or not it served in wartime, uh, just you know, how much, how much death has occurred on the ship, how much tragedy Mm -hmm. was, uh, was witnessed there to this. I I love that term, Adam, that, that supernatural sludge or paranormal sludge that just gets left behind after all of these events, um, that lends itself to hauntings and, you know, ships really seem to be, um, just a magnet for this kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, they do. Not really sure why, but um, seeing the the just the number of ships that come up when you look at haunted ships not not ghost ships but haunted ships it's um it it's just it, it's massive. Really you know, is the, yeah the sheer number of it. If we didn't cover your favorite one either, let us know. Um, you know, there may be a, a haunted ships part two at some point. Um, if we find some other really good ones to do, because there's a ton, we could probably have five parts to this, especially if I pulled down the full history of every ship and all of its battles and everything like that. We could go on for many, many hours. Um, so if you're interested in that, like we've said a couple times, go do more research on it. You'll yeah. you'll be quite surprised at the amount of history these places um give you on the ships yeah so this is the point in the show where we usually ask what do you what do you think you know do you think these ships are haunted do you have an idea as to why ships would be um more apt to be haunted than say other locations um but i want to add something to that i i know we've got um a lot of members of the graveyard that have have served not just in the U.S. military, but in uh, in other militaries around the world. Um, yep. Maybe you guys have some experiences. Whether you served on a uh, on a regular, uh, you know, a military ship, you maybe you served on a submarine. Um, if if you've got a weird paranormal experience that you had aboard 
uh, a ship while in service, you know, let us know that that would be really interesting, you know, uh, not just for Adam and I, but for the other members of the graveyard. So, yep. um, so if, if you're a, a current or former, uh, serviceman, then, and you've had something weird like that happen while on board a ship, you know, drop the story in our Facebook group. And uh, I've got an old friend who actually is, um, in the Navy and I'm trying to get in touch with him for this episode and I couldn't, but if he brings back any stories from his first deployment there, I will let you guys know. Yeah. I think the, these are, these are some really cool stories. Uh, but don't forget to go and check out our other social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, you can also look at our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, you can listen to the show, learn a little bit more about Adam and myself. Uh, you can find links to buy Graveyard Tells merchandise. And hey, the holidays are coming up. You know, if you if you need a gift idea for your uh you know, your your friend or family member that's uh uh a fan of the show, uh picking picking up a, a graveyard tales coffee mug or hoodie or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam really is a fan of the the notepad that they've got available on there too. Yeah. Um very much so. I love you know, that thing. Good gifts and stocking stuffers there. Um but you can also become a patron and we've mentioned Patre uh Patreon episodes on here a couple of times tonight. Um, that's another great gift. You know, if you've got someone that, that listens to the show, giving them access to all that bonus content along with the videos of us recording the show, um, would, would be great. So you can definitely gift that, uh, to someone. Um, but we really do appreciate, um, the donations to the show. Uh, it mm -hmm. really helps Adam and I cover the cost of producing the show, having the right equipment, up, updating everything so that we continue to produce quality content for you guys. Right. Well, I think that's all we got for Haunted Ships this go around. So yep. until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon.